Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa So I had a request to comment on the Chaitanya Karaniya Sutta and Guttarnakaya 11.2 and um, it's a short sutta, but it's got some really, really good uh, dhamma in it. So I printed out these to make it a le- little easier to follow, these cheat sheets. And pass them around, everybody can take one. And study them well, it'll be on the test. <laughs> <laughs> Thought it would be easier to follow if you could have a visual representation so I'll begin by uh, because it's quite short really I'll begin just read I'll read out without a break I'll read the um, Bhikkhu Bodhi translation he translates the title as volition Bhikkhus for a virtuous person one whose behavior is virtuous no volition needs to be exerted let non-regret arise in me it is natural that non-regret arises in one who is virtuous. For one who is without regret, no volition need be exerted. Let joy arise in me. It is natural that joy arises in one without regret. For one who is joyful, no volition need be exerted. Let rapture arise in me. It is natural that rapture arises in one who is joyful. For one with a rapturous mind, no volition need be exerted. Let my body become tranquil. It is natural that the body of one with a rapturous mind is tranquil. For one who is tranquil in body, no volition need be exerted. Let me feel pleasure. It is natural that one tranquil in body feels pleasure. For one feeling pleasure, no volition need be exerted. Let my mind be concentrated. It is natural that the mind of one feeling pleasure is concentrated. For one who is concentrated, no volition need be exerted. Let me know and see things as they really are. It is natural that one who is concentrated knows and sees things as they really are. For one who knows things as they really are, no volition need be exerted. Let me be disenchanted. It is natural that one who knows and sees things as they really are is disenchanted. For one who is disenchanted, no volition needs to be exerted. Let me become dispassionate. It is natural that one who is disenchanted becomes dispassionate. For one who is dispassionate, no volition need be exerted. Let me realize the knowledge and vision of liberation. It is natural that one who is dispassionate realizes the knowledge and vision of liberation. Thus, bhikkhus, the knowledge and vision of liberation is the purpose and benefit of dispassion. Dispassion is the purpose and benefit of disenchantment. Disenchantment is the purpose and benefit of knowledge and vision of things as they really are. Knowledge and vision of things as they really are is the purpose and benefit of concentration. Concentration is the purpose and benefit of pleasure. Pleasure is the purpose and benefit of tranquility. Tranquility is the purpose and benefit of rapture. Rapture is the purpose and benefit of joy. Joy is the purpose and benefit of non-regret. Non-regret is the purpose and benefit of virtuous behavior. Thus, bhikkhus, one stage flows into the next. One stage fills up the next stage for going from the near shore to the far shore. This sequence of states is a very similar sequence of states as found in the Upanisha Sutta, uh, which is in Samyutta Nikaya. There's a couple of uh, differences that are interesting to look at, but the um, basic structure is the same. The Upanisha Sutta is the one that Bhikkhu Bodhi is translated uh, as a transcendental dependent arising. And he's written a long essay on that that's, that's quite good, very, very uh, thorough. And it, it follows the same kind of theme. Instead of saying no, no volition is needed in the Upanisha Sutta, it says that the state fl- one state flows into the other just as water flows down a mountain, starting with little trickles of water and then becoming streams and creeks and mighty rivers and then ends up in the sea. 
So in both texts, we have the idea that uh, the progression of the mind towards enlightenment is a natural progression. It follows uh, one state flows into the other. And there's a, a number of points that are um, important to, for our practice that we can take from this. One is something that should always be remembered that the various uh, higher states or what are called higher states of, of mind are actually more natural states of mind. There are kind of primordial mind, our real true nature. And it's the obscurations and defilements that keep us from seeing that. There's a kind of a paradox here that's that should be uh, contemplated. On the one hand, the Buddha says elsewhere, he says that the path is for the energetic, not for the lazy. And he emphasizes the importance of striving diligently. But uh, in a number of places like these two suttas, he says the one state flows into the other. And here he, here he says quite specifically, no intention is required. The states lead naturally into each other. So there's a kind of a, a perfect balance in the mind when one is meditating that uh, uh, when the practice is going really well, when you're practicing perfectly, it doesn't actually feel like you're putting in any effort and you're not meditating, you're just being. Well, the perfect practice is doing nothing. The most perfect practice, but it's extremely difficult. Extremely difficult, astoundingly difficult to do nothing. But it's that's the perfect practice. And I've heard it called um, diligent effortlessness is the state to, to strive for. Diligent effortlessness. So you don't feel like you're putting in any effort, but you're completely diligent. You're not missing a, a, a mind moment. Your, your practice is perfect. And this is the um, this can be experienced, for example, in the later stages of the Vipassana path, as laid out in the Stagecoach Relay Sutta in Majjhima Nikaya and extensively commented on in the Vasudhimaga and by Mahasi Sayadaw, the stages of insight. The stage just before enlightenment is called um, equanimity of formations. And it's the, uh, we could say, the, um, the jumping off place. It's not itself enlightenment, but it's the state of mind where enlightenment becomes possible. And there's no effort you can do in that state to realize Nibbana, but it can happen. And when you're in that state, the meditation feels completely easy and smooth and perfect, but there's no sense of trying or pushing or struggling. It's just happening. and You're not really doing anything. So there's a natural, if you allow the mind to flow, if you're not obstructing it, I think this is where, you know, where the effort comes in is to, the effort to not be diverted, not be obstructed, to just let the process unfold. It becomes a natural process, like the rivers flowing down the mountain. And in this sutta, uh, in the Anguttara Sutta, uh, Chitta Karaniya, the repeated phrases, no intention is, is needed. One state leads naturally into the other. So let's look at the particular list of states. The, uh, this sutta, uh, the Anguttara Sutta, begins with sila, begins with virtue, whereas the Upanisha Sutta the sequence starts with sada or faith. The Upanisha Sutta also has a uh, extended 
section at the beginning, it goes through the standard dependent origination from ignorance through to craving, or becoming, craving, clean. But then instead of in the uh, standard sequence, it's um, birth, old age, and death. Those stages are compressed into one, which is called suffering or dukkha. And then uh, faith arises out of dukkha. So faith or in this sutta, sila or virtue. So there are different starting points, you know, but they're obviously related. If you keep good sila, if you live in, an, in a morally ethical way, the benefit here and now, immediate benefit, is ease of mind. It's um, called non-regret in this sutta. Non-regret, non-remorse. Now, if you're following precepts, there, you don't have anything disturbing your mind, thinking about the things you've done, the, you know, you, the um, immoral deeds you've done, preying on your mind, making you feel remorseful or guilty or ashamed. You know, you, your mind is at ease right away when you're keeping the precepts. It's automatically at ease. It's non-regret. So you live harmoniously, you know, you live harmoniously amongst your fellow beings and you've got peace internally when you keep the precepts and it's the foundation stone for everything else. And because of this keeping the precepts and non-regret, uh, joy arises, pamoja. You know, and this also arises from faith in the other sequence. In the Pali, there's, there are at least three words that have been translated or can be translated as happiness. There's pomoja, piti, and sukha. Pomoja is also translated as delight or joy. It's, it's the simplest form of happiness. It's just, you know, being happy. You can see a pomoja on, on display when uh, you throw the frisbee to the dog and she runs after it. You know, it's just full of pomoja. This is a, it was very, uh, very evident. And a pomoja could arise from uh, simple things, but it also can arise from, you know, spiritual causes. Faith is a, is a cause of, of joy or delight in this way. And you can see this, I think, in um, religious paths, spiritual paths that are very, faith-based, like the bhakti yoga in Hinduism or some branches of Christianity, uh, people become full of faith. They become very joyful, kind of blissed out. Faith is the cause of joy or delight, just as sila or non-regret. You know, you have, if you're living harmoniously, you feel happy about it. And this happiness can or will without, you know, if, if it's not obstructed, if the process is allowed to flow, it deepens into piti. Piti is translated as, sometimes it's translated as happiness, sometimes as rapture is a common one. I've also seen it translated as ecstasy. It's um, a, a more kind of thrilling kind of happiness. And it has a technical place in the system of the jhanas. It's one of the jhana factors. PT has, it's a mental factor. It's a kind of upswelling of happiness, but it has a physical effect in that you can feel it in the body, various kind of rapturous or ecstatic effects in the body, like the sense of tingling or rushes up the spine. Uh, there are descriptions of various grades and types of PT. The most elevated kind of PT is the, is the kind of pity that makes you feel like um, the body is weightless. 
you feel this kind of it can actually feel like you're floating like you're levitating and people sometimes get if this they experience this they they lose their concentration because they become a bit alarmed they think they're actually floating you know they'll open their eyes and oh no i'm still on the floor but there's a very sensation of that it's weightlessness so sila pamoja pt and then this leads to tranquility and here's one small difference between the two texts in the um upanishasutta the uh, state is simply described simply called pasadi tranquility and in the chitanakaraniya sutta it's called kayo pasati tranquility of the body so the emphasis is uh, is a slight difference in emphasis we're talking about the um, the physical effect of the pt is ease and peace of the body like it kind of washes away a uh, the knots and the the uh, the pains in the body, and the body feels at ease. But it's obviously also a tranquility of the mind, a peacefulness. You know, it's a, a sense of well-being. People who are tranquil, who have pasadi naturally, they're pleasant to be around. You know, there's no uh, no agitation. It's a, a state of of being at ease, being at peace, being comfortable. And this leads to the highest form of happiness, sukha. This is also a jhana factor. Sukha is usually translated as bliss. And it represents a deeper happiness, a happiness that's transcended all the kind of ecstatic fireworks of PT and is now just a peaceful oceanic deep happiness and the only physical association is the complete ease and comfort of the body but there's no kind of action here a difference between PT and sukha can be illustrated by the comparison to the parallel states in the Brahma worlds. The Brahmas of the, the second level, the Abhasara Brahmas, and their predominant factor is Piti in their mind. And the third level Brahmas, higher than them, the Subakina Brahmas, their dominant factor is bliss. And this is physically shown by the difference in their radiance the brahma gods are beings of light and they have a lot of uh, an aura of radiance the aura of the abhasara beings flickers like a torch whereas the radiance of the subakina beings is steady like the full moon and when the mind has reached this state of a pleasant, peaceful happiness. It's if it's again, if it's not obstructed, if it's allowed to flow, it leads naturally into samadhi. Samadhi is, of course, a very important, critical factor in meditation. It's usually been translated as concentration, but I really don't like that translation. I, I like to prefer to call it stillness or stability, which is actually the definition given in the old texts, like the Vasudhimaga just defines it as non-wavering, the stability of mind. So the, the mind is has come to this uh, peaceful state, and this is... Samadhi is associated with the state of uh, ekagata, which is uh, the unity of mind. So the mind has it has come to a unification. It's not flitting around from object to object, but it's very stable. It's like rock solid. And this, and the um, perfection of samadhi is jhana. 
And from samadhi, from this uh, stillness of mind, there will naturally arise a perception of reality. Now, and this is yata-bhuta-nanadasana, the, literally the knowledge and vision of things as they are. In uh, the uh, descriptions of, of practice that we find in the suttas, a common theme is to develop jhana and then to investigate or to take as an object of investigation emergence from jhana. So this has been traditionally the way many meditation traditions teach is you develop the jhanas and then you do insight or vipassana after subsequent to that. That's the most traditional way of practice. So from samadhi, when the mind has that stillness, one of the qualities that samadhi gives to the mind is called in English wieldiness or malleability. The, the, like be, the mind becomes, you're able to control it. You're able to do something with it. And if that's turned to investigation, then one sees reality. Normally, you know, the, the untrained mind is not, has difficulty or is unable to see things as they actually are. You know, we filter it through our desires and through our fears and through a self-reference and we complicate things and we see it through multiple filters. Whereas you see things as they actually are, you're seeing it without any filters. You're seeing reality naked and as it actually is. And this is really seeing the characteristics, the tilakana, imperfection, impermanence, and emptiness. And when you see things clearly that way, that's uh, liberating to the mind. You're seeing things as they actually are. You're not being deluded. You're not being fooled. And seeing things as they actually are naturally flows into nibida. Nibida is a really difficult word to translate. I've seen all kinds of different things as attempted translations. I prefer disenchantment, which is what Bhikkhu Bodhi uses. I think it's is it's not bad. Some some of the older translations translated as something like revulsion, which is I think too too harsh. But it's when the mind has seen things as they actually are. It's like you've taken your rose-colored glasses off and you're seeing, you know, the, the imperfection of things and the impermanence of things. You kind of lose your enchantment with samsara. And this can be... Not necessarily, I think, but often can possibly be somewhat painful or unpleasant, you know, particularly if you've been living in a very deeply deluded state and now you're seeing things as they actually are. You know, you have the sense of, you know, here's this body, so attached to this body, and it's rotting away as I sit here. And uh, the mind is just a jumble, and there's nothing in the inside or outside to depend on or take a stand or, or be secure with. So you can lose, you do lose your enchantment with samsara. And if you resist that, that vision of reality, if you, you can retreat back into your delusions, then People can get stuck here at, th at this kind of stage, and it can be <coughs> a difficult passage. It's kind of—I think—it's comparable to what the Christian mystics call the dark night of the soul. The way to get through it is not—is just to to face it. The way out is down and through. You have to just face your your demons, your boogeymen, and keep going forward. So if, 
if you don't resist, if you just let it flow, the natural process, without any particular effort, this leads to the next stage, which is viraga or dispassion, which is a very literal translation. Viraga is um, passion, desire, and desire is the the uh, second noble truth. It's the cause of suffering, tanha, and it is the energy or the motor of samsara. That's what keeps the wheel turning, is, is uh, raga, this passion for experience. And the negative side of that is, is fear. Right? So the negative raga is, is, is fear. So fear and fascination or passion and you know, fearfulness is what keeps us running round and round. This passion is just not doing that. It's like the mind is, in the previous two stages, mind has come to the realization that, you know, samsara is a, is a losing game. It's playing solitaire with a deck of 51. There's no possible way of win in samsara. So then the mind comes to peace with that. It's this passion. So, okay, I'm just not playing that game anymore. And this naturally leads to uh, enlightenment. And that's, it, it's phrased in two slightly different ways in the two suttas. In the sutta we're looking at, Angutra, the Anguttara Sutta, it's a Vimuti Jnana Dasana, knowledge and vision of liberation. It's just given as one unit. So, so the mind realizes freedom. Nibbana is realized quite simply when we stop doing samsara you know we just stop doing it then uh, we realize we realize uh, nibbana the samsara should be thought of as something we do it's an activity it's, it's a choice we're making moment by moment and when we don't make that choice then the knowledge and vision of liberation arises. The word vimuti is uh, l- literally means the breaking of chains, the cutting of bonds. And um, a mundane use of that would be like the emancipation of a slave. So vimuti means uh, freedom. It's a freedom from samsara. It's a word that's most often used in the suttas for um, the, the process and experience of enlightenment, the vimuti, liberation. In the uh, Upanishad Sutta, it's, it's uh, broken up into two. It's slightly different. Vimuti and then asavakaya, destruction of the asavas. The asavas are the like the root defilements, the corruptions. So the mind is absolutely purified. You know that this is the mind of a of a enlightened being is is absolutely purified. In the mind of an arahant, no negative state arises. And this phrasing asavakaya is used in the uh, description of the Buddha's own enlightenment, the moment when he actually attained Buddhahood is described in this way as the destruction of the corruptions or the taints. So it's absolute purification. So uh, in, in summary, we have a sequence of stages that the mind goes through, beginning with the basis of virtue and faith and leading naturally through various kinds of happiness to uh, stillness and then the insight and understanding of reality and then disengagement from samsara and then liberation. One 
um, perhaps secondary point to make about this. You'll notice in both lists the importance of uh, in the early stages, beginning with Pomoja, the, the importance of joy or happiness. I think this is something that can be uh, easily overlooked. Sometimes people looking at Buddhism think of it as a kind of a gloomy religion, pessimistic religion, but it's actually put a lot of emphasis on, on being joyful. I remember one time... I was giving a public talk and somebody asked in the question and answers, somebody asked me, oh, why is it you Buddhists always talk about suffering all the time? It seems like really like negative. And I said, well, that's not fair. We also talk about pain, illness, death, and despair. <laughs> <laughs> then, I, no, then I give a serious answer. <laughs> So, uh, you know, that's important to remember that um, joy is an enlightenment factor. You know? And the, uh, the overall theme, I think, is important too. The idea of this diligent non-effort. This, uh, or another way I've heard it called, this undistracted non-meditation. Just being you know, if you can if you can practice just being without checking the process or obstructing it, like and I think this is a you know, one of the one of the common mistakes I think people make is pushing too hard. And also the um the kind of false perspective of the uh of jhanas and uh, enlightenment as being something exotic and out there and beyond and something something new to be attained well really it's just uncovering your natural primordial mind and and oh, i always uh, i always like the um tibetan image uh, of the uh, the blue sky mind the the perfect beautiful blue sky is always present even on the cloudiest darkest day it's just hidden by the clouds but it's still there and you just have to blow the clouds away and the, the beautiful blue clear sky shows forth <laughs> 